No, they can't. Why Governments Fail, But Individuals Succeed is the title of a book and the subject of a lecture presented by Fox Business Network and Fox News Channel correspondent John Stossel in April at Troy University. Sponsored by Troy's Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy, Stossel's lecture and book advocate the merits of a free market and economic liberty over government regulation and centralized control of the economy. In a career spanning four decades, Stossel has won 19 Emmy Awards and has been honored five times for excellence in consumer reporting by the National Press Club. Stossel's advocacy journalism reflects a libertarian political philosophy and his views on economics support a free market. Central planning appeals to people. There's a sense that, you know, I can't get my brain around how you build a sewage treatment plant myself. I wouldn't know how. I, I want to trust the people in state capitals in Washington. Uh, and they're so smart. I mean, there, there really is a sense that the guy who was on the Harvard Law Review, that, that he could do it better. He could direct an economy. And this probably comes from intuition because we grow up with parents who direct our lives and keep us safe. We feel good about that. Our ancestors grew up in little clans worth 100 people maybe, 200 people. And if you didn't follow the wisdom of the tribal leaders, if you didn't harvest the fruit at the right time, you died and you didn't give birth to you. We're programmed to follow the central planners. But that just doesn't work in a big society. What works in a big society is the invisible hand. It's people pursuing their own interest for profit because if you get a profit, that means you've served your customer well. But people don't get that. It's not intuitive. We're not wired to reason how impersonal market forces can solve problems. People say, even if people get it for silly things, not silly things, but clear things, simple things like cell phones or music and movies, free market produces the best of that, Stossel, okay. But when it comes to serious stuff, health care, the patient doesn't know what he needs, education, parents don't know what the curriculum should be, who a good teacher is, you need government to plan that. And that makes sense to people. But then I answer by saying, but you know, I don't understand much about cars, do you? Do you know why one is safer than another or why one runs better than another? I sure don't. But compare the worst car you can buy here in Alabama to the best that the genius central planners of the Eastern Bloc could produce. And that was this car. <laughs> that and the Yugo. And this one was designed by the East Germans. They were rocket scientists. And it was a terrible car. Uh, you young people may not know about it, but people had the, people lined up to get one. But it, it polluted, it was hard to shift, uh, and you had to put the oil and gas in separately and shake the car to mix them together. <laughs> this disappeared as soon as the Berlin Wall went down. So why? Why was their best unable to compete with our mediocre stuff? because not everybody has to be an expert for the free market to work. It's magic. You just need a few people, a few car buffs, a few people to read the car magazines. And in an open society, the good and bad news spread. The good companies thrive, the bad ones atrophy. Freedom will protect everybody, the ignorant too, even the people who don't pay attention. The word will get out. Healthcare. People say, well, yeah, you're going to have a heart attack and on the way to the hospital, you're going to be doing research and who will give you the best treatment or which place to go to. But no, the market works that out in advance. You don't have to do that because reputation guides you. People will know which hospital is thought to give good care for heart attacks. And people will know if you had a market in health care, prices would be posted. People would know which ones were affordable. But we don't have that when government runs things. And yet government has a powerful case, or a seemingly powerful case to make. They make life better. Do you know what OSHA is, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, one of the zillion alphabet soups of agencies we have uh, in, in Washington? They say, you know, factories were killing their workers. They didn't give a damn if they had dangerous working conditions. So we have to have a thick rule book to make sure they don't hurt workers. And look what's happened since we created OSHA.
look how many lives we've saved. The head of OSHA under Bill Clinton was fond of showing this chart, and it is impressive. Until you look at what happened before OSHA. In a free society, things get better. When governments like somebody who jumps in front of a parade and claims to lead the parade, things get better because we get smarter. We get richer, so we care more about safety. The workers themselves uh, start paying more attention to what hurts people. Even the greedy employer cares, if only because it costs him money to retrain workers when he kills one. Things get better on their own without government. Same thing happened with the war on poverty. Lyndon Johnson said he was going to cure poverty. It created welfare, and the poverty rate went down sharply. But then, as you know, it stopped. It's gone up and down since because we taught people to be dependent. People stopped lifting themselves out of poverty. So look at the chart on the poverty rate. So you can see the line was going down even more sharply before the war on poverty. Government stopped the progress. It took me too long in my reporting to see that's what government usually does. And government grows. Here's a chart that shows the growth. For most of the history of the republic, government was less than a couple percent of the economy. Now it's 40 percent if you include state and local. Here it is in 10-year in increments to smooth out the World War bumps. And now, as you know, we're on an unsustainable course. Uh, we can't pay our bills. We've made promises to people my age in terms of Medicare that there's just no way they're going to be able to keep. And yet, when someone suggests we should change the slope of this line, people scream, cruel, unfair, and they spend more money. I mean, even the most obvious programs are the, the failures they won't cut. How about one that everybody thinks is one of the best programs, Head Start? This is one where if you don't have two parents who read to you, you're disadvantaged. So to bridge the gap between the advantage and the disadvantage, we'll give them an extra year of school before kindergarten. We'll spend $20,000 per child. We'll narrow that gap. Intuitively, this makes sense. You give the kid who's home watching TV a year of extra schooling from caring people, he'll do better. But then the government does its own study of the results. The president said, we're going to discontinue programs that don't work. So they studied this one. And what they find about Head Start? It doesn't work. It doesn't make any difference. Their own study found no difference, not in high school. They couldn't even find the difference the next year in first grade. They couldn't tell which kids got Head Start and which didn't. So do they get rid of the program? No, of course not. They increased spending on it. That's what they always do. So this is what I say. This is why I say government can. So I'm going to go around with this. Uh, and the rest of my book tour, this is day three of 20 cities, um, and try to get my book on the bestseller list to get Rachel Maddow off there. <laughs> Glad you clapped for that. I always get nervous about that. I, they're going to be selling books out here afterward. I hope you buy a bunch for your friends, and we can. It's a New York Times uh, bookstore. They get on the list, so. Uh, I hope we can bump her off. And the, the message I'm trying to share is what I've learned in, in my 43 years of reporting. Government fails, but individuals do succeed in all kinds of ways doing good things. I mean, the, the groups of individuals who help create institutions like this one, they accomplish all kinds of things. I mean, why is America prosperous? I ask high school kids, and they say, well, it's because we're a democracy. We have, we're a new country with lots of natural resources. And I say, that's why we're rich, and uh, two billion people on Earth live on a dollar or two a day. I mean, it's pretty unusual what we've accomplished out of the seven billion people on Earth. Maybe if 
few hundred million live like we do, most people are much poorer. And they say, yeah, it's democracy, natural resources. So I say, well, India is a democracy. It's poor. India has lots of natural resources. They say, well, India is overpopulated. But actually, the population density of India is the same as that of New Jersey. New Jersey does OK, depending on your point of view. <laughs> and what about Hong Kong? Hong Kong doesn't have any natural resources. It's just a rock. It doesn't have democracy either. It was ruled by the British and then now by the communists. And yet Hong Kong went from desperately poor to our level of wealth in just 50 years. Went from third world to first world. What did they do? They had economic freedom. That's what matters. We know what works. That's what America had. Limited government. That was the genius of the founders. In Hong Kong, the British rulers enforced a rule of law. We need that. We need a government to make sure I don't kill you or take your stuff. I'd add some pollution rules. But then the British rulers sat around and drank tea. They left free people alone. And free people left, them, left alone created prosperity. Economic freedom works. Capitalism in this past 100 years has lifted billions of people out of stoop labor and the misery of poverty. And yet it's vilified in every college I've visited and every newsroom I've worked in. Oh, that's greedy. That's business. I'm trying to understand what's this hatred of suspicion of business about? Because business can't use force. Government can. Why aren't we scared of government? No, people are scared of business. And I thought it's because people are envious of the rich business people. And I am too, frankly. I don't like it that some people have so much more than I. But it's a byproduct of freedom. Um, I thought maybe the, the you students are taught by your professors that capitalism has to be controlled because they're envious that their slightly stupider roommate when they were in college is now in business and making more than they are. <laughs> you know, the wealth disparity is something that bothers people. But then I thought about the kings and queens of old Europe. They were filthy rich, much, you know, a million times richer than the average person, and yet people didn't hate them. They revered them. But they hated the bourgeoisie. They gave them that nasty name. They hated the very people who sold them the things they needed to make their lives better. What's that about? I'm trying to get my head around it. And I've come to think it's because unless you have some understanding of economics, you think of business as a zero-sum game. And I see why politicians think that way, because their world is zero-sum. One person wins, somebody else loses. But business isn't because it's voluntary. Two ways to do things in life, right? forced or voluntary. Government is forced. We need some force, some rule of law. The worst places to live are the places that don't have that, the African country where nobody will build a factory because somebody may steal what you make or the dictator may confiscate your whole factory. So we need some force. But the best of life is the voluntary part. And look what that creates. People don't see it as win-win, but it is win-win. They think Bill Gates has 50 billion dollars, that means I have 50 billion less. There's this pie and he took a big piece, I get a smaller piece. But because business is voluntary, it doesn't work that way. The transaction doesn't happen unless both of you think they won. Nobody was forced to buy Bill Gates' software. He had no guns that he was legally allowed to use. Only government has that. S somehow, OK, individuals have guns, but you can't <laughs> legally use them on people to force them to give you money unless you're the government. That business is win-win, you can understand that if you really think about even the simplest transaction, you buy a cup of coffee. You give her the book, she gives you the coffee. You say, thank you, thank you. Why the weird double thank you moment? Why do you both say thank you? Because you wanted the coffee more than you wanted the buck. She wanted the buck more than she wanted the coffee. 
It doesn't happen unless you both win. Business, if they are free, make us all wealthier. Economic freedom creates prosperity. And economists focus on the prosperous part of that sentence, but the freedom part is just as important. I object to big government, not just because it leaves people poor, but it's a moral objection. When government reduces our control over our own lives, our lives are less. If we cannot tell the mob or even our neighbors to leave us alone, we are less. Government sucks the life out of people. It cuts the tendrils of community, crowds out charities and all kinds of voluntary organizations. And that's why when I say, that's why when politicians say, yes, we can, Frederick Hayek said, the curious task of economics is to teach men how little they know about what they imagine they can design. Well, we haven't done that well because government keeps growing. But cheer up, saying that government can't do it isn't the same as saying free people can't do it because we do it all the time. We just don't notice how much better things have become. We take the benefits of capitalism for granted. We just accept it that we can go to a supermarket and it'll have 30,000 products on average. They'll all be pretty cheap. Uh, it'll be open 24-7 and they rarely poison us. <laughs> On the government the supermarket in the Soviet Union, people starved. Mothers sent their children into the fields to kill rats and mice for food. Government can't do it, the private sector does it, we just take it for granted. We take it for granted that uh, I can go to a foreign country, stick a piece of plastic in the wall, and cash will come out. And uh, give that same piece of plastic to a total stranger who doesn't even speak English, and he'll rent me a car for a week. And when I get home, Visa or MasterCard will have the accounting correct to the penny. I just assume that. But government can't even count the votes accurately. <laughs> so we're going to trust government to run K through 12 education, to run all of health care because it's intuitive? Well, yes, we are. But I say, no, they can't. We shouldn't. Individuals bring us the good stuff. Clubs, charities, community groups, greedy, profit-seeking private enterprises give us robotic limbs and hip replacements and small cell phones, computers, air conditioning. Poor people today, because of free enterprise, have access to food, music, travel that kings didn't have access to 100 years ago. All because of free enterprise. Government fails but individuals succeed. And I hope you fight for the limited government that makes that possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. I sort of rushed through that because for me the most fun talking to students or the rest of you is the Q&A. So let's do some of that before I go sign books. I'm told there's a microphone. He's got a microphone. If you would just maybe yell or call him over and then everybody can hear, grab his microphone. And also, why don't you say who you are first so your neighbors can get to know you. My name is Steve Swan, and I work with International Office here. I was wondering if you could suggest two economists in the past 200 years that everyone should read, what would they be and why? Uh, I would say von Mises and Hayek and the Constitution of Liberty by Hayek really explains these ideas. However, they are so dense <laughs> that I, could barely, I couldn't get through them. Um, so I really suggest Milton Friedman, free to choose, he makes it easier. Or buy a copy of... <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, actually, I'm not an economist, so I'd add Thomas Sowell to the list. He, he makes it understandable. Yes, who's next? I just... Boy, I'm in Alabama, you know, in New York. They're just popping out the, you know, I disagree with you about this, or oh, I agree with you. Well, I have to wonder how we can get the dollar under control when this is going on. I mean, they have promised my generation, the baby boomers, that they're going to pay our Medicare bill. But we rudely keep refusing to die. <laughs> and I mean, I talk to old people in retirement homes, wealthy, and I say, you know, Medicare is unsustainable. It's got a it's 30 plus trillion dollars in the red, and and it, you know, and we need a later retirement age. We need to make some adjustments. And they say, uh, uh. I paid into that all those years. They took these FICA payments out of every paycheck. This is an insurance plan. But that's another lie from the politicians because it wasn't an insurance plan and there's no Social Security account in your name. The politicians, as usual, spent every penny the second they got it on the other stuff and other promises they made. And if somebody's going to pay for my Medicare and Social Security, it's got to come from you young people working now. And the demographics don't make sense anymore because there are lots of us and not enough of you. Not as many as there used to be when this system was paying for itself. And we older people now get two to three times what we pay in. Again, because we won't die when, when FDR created Social Security, most people didn't even live to age 65. So what are they going to do? We got this unsustainable curve. I assume they'll just print more money. And they'll, I mean, they say, well, you know, we're going to have to make adjustments. But I don't think they will because we older people vote. You don't. <laughs> they're not going to say, I'm not paying your Medicare doctor. So I, I think they're just going to pay. Yeah, I'll pay. Here's the $1,000 to pay your bill. But by then, there'll be so much money around that you could also use that $1,000 to buy a loaf of bread and they will devalue everybody's savings, we will have rampant inflation. In Zimbabwe, they issued a trillion dollar bill recently. I mean, this wrecks economies. This makes us all poor. But I don't think they're going to cut. I mean, in Greece, we see riots. They barely cut. One advantage we have is that other societies will blow up before we do. Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal. Uh, Japan, because they have lots of older people and not many young people, fewer immigrants coming in to support the elderly. So one option would be competition's good for everything. Why not competition in currencies? I mean, you could have the gold standard. That would be competition. But it has some disadvantages. Uh, why not? Why shouldn't I be able to issue stossels? <laughs> Stossel currency. You'd say, why would I trust that? Well, excuse me, I have an income and I spend less than I make. Unlike the people who issue those things called Federal Reserve notes. Um, somebody shouted, in the Fed. And you know, I'm not going to talk about that. It's, uh, but, doesn't it creep you out a bit that we give 12 men the power to spend a trillion of your dollars as they see fit? It does creep me out. I mean, we could have, we could have these competing currencies. And they might have advantages. Some people suggest you could have a chip in them that would prevent counterfeiting. But it's not legal. The government locks people up who issue competing currencies. Government only grows. And like the TSA, it keeps out competition. Yes, who's next here? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Nicole Woodburn. I'm an undergrad headed to law school. Um, you spend a lot of your time on Fox News as a, as a news contributor. And in your book, I um, 
uh, give me a break. Uh, you spent a lot of time outlining the problems that we have with government and with spending. But how do we stop the buck? How do we actually turn it around, or has it gotten too far? I mean, I, I, I don't think it's gotten too far. I mean, humans are very resilient, and I never thought welfare reform was possible. And despite all this growth of government, uh, the economy has grown stupendously. Who could have predicted that computers and Silicon Valley would change our lives, enrich our lives so much? And I don't think it's any accident that uh, this great prosperity happened in Seattle and San Francisco, the two capitals farthest from Washington, D.C. They used to have no lobbyists, but now they're crawling with them. You know, it's possible. We don't even have to cut the budget that much. If we simply stop the growth of government, we could balance the budget in 15 years. We just need to slow its growth. And the best, uh, you know, I don't know how to do that except to keep doing my shows on TV and to get everyone to buy. No, they can't. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carrie Rife, back here. And I'm a professor of journalism and communication here. <laughs> well, <okay>. Way back. <laughs> right here. It's dark, and can we have the house lights on? And um, I was just wondering what your thoughts of Occupy Wall Street are. I went there and they yelled at me as soon as they <laughs> saw me. I mean, they're bothered by by the income disparity, a lot of people are. Uh, some of, I wish, that, you know, a few were, they were bothered that banks got bailed out, and they shouldn't get bailed out. Um, market discipline is what protects us better than regulation, and you don't have market discipline if you bail out the dummies, and we did, with taxpayer money, that was wrong. But most of them were just silly narcissists who wanted attention, and they have a million different causes. Uh, the media overcovered it because it was easy. It was right there where we live in New York, in one location. I mean, the media are part of the problem here because we cover what's easy to cover and what we can see. Take something like the minimum wage. It's intuitive, again, that we help poor people if we raise the minimum wage. And the media can go and take pictures and interview somebody who got a raise. Yeah, I'm happy I got a raise. But we can't take pictures of the person who never gets hired because some company doesn't expand because of the minimum wage or a construction company decides not to have apprentices. Construction used to be a business where you'd learn on the job. No more. Uh, you used to have people washing your windshield in gas stations at you know, low wages, a teenager who got his first work experience that way. No way because of the minimum wage. But I can't take pictures of people not washing my windshield or of the guy who didn't get the job, I don't even know who it is. So the media tends to favor the things they can see, and that's what government often creates. Yes, you with the microphone. Whoever has the mic should go. Uh, AJ Davis from uh, Troy, uh, English major. Two-part question. First, uh -oh. just, English majors, yeah. those are the people who never get this, but let's see what your <laughs> question is. First, first question. First question, would the Stossel currency have the stash? <laughs> yes. Because I would, I would back that heavily. Second, um, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul has proposed the penny plan, where all government departments should, for a number of years, every year, cut one penny from every dollar that they spend and have real cuts instead of this assumed 8% or so increase uh, for federal budget planning. What do you think on that? I think that's one of many great ideas. He has many, uh, lots of ways to shrink government. I would like to think that every new administration that comes in should have to start with a budget plan from scratch. And then instead of just lowering the budget of the Department of Commerce, maybe you'd say, we don't need a Department of Commerce. Commerce just happens without a department. Uh, Mitt Romney met with some people and said, you know, I'm going to shrink government by 10 percent. By attrition, he was quick to say. What's with this attrition stuff? Uh, Jack Welch, when he ran GE, when it was a growth company before it became partly a ward of government, 
um, used to say, you have to get rid of the bottom 10%. Every year, the creative destruction that cleans out the deadwood or you're not a growing dynamic institution. So to do it by attrition, that isn't management. And yet that's what we get from the supposedly pro-business Republican. It was a disappointment. Yes, sir. Ralph Black, WTVF Radio. My question is, you mentioned that the uh, Federal Reserve, you, we give them 12 men the authority over this money situation. Sure, how would you change that? Surely you wouldn't give it to Congress. Uh, no, but... What would you do, in other words? How would you change uh, it? I'm, I don't know. I'm not qualified to really say what the solution is or whether we need a central I mean, I, my instinct is to say we don't need a central bank. We didn't used to have one. And there were, there were less dramatic booms and busts before we had a central bank. But I, I have not reported on it enough and researched it enough to, to feel comfortable about giving a smart answer, so I'm going to shut up about that and go to the next question or comment. Hi, uh, my name is David Hudman. I am a uh, sophomore business major uh, here at Troy. And uh, you talked about the government needing to you know, regulate things as far as you know, protecting people's property and making sure one person doesn't kill another person. That's obviously important. But you also said pollution uh, is important. But you know, there are people that try to use pollution to control our lives more. So is there a free market solution to pollution uh, violating our rights? I mean, the libertarians say the tort system could be used to fight pollution instead of the EPA. But I, I just think the tort system is so gummed up that that would be even worse. And I'm glad we've had an EPA. The air and water are cleaner than they used to be. When I was the age of you students, you couldn't open the windows in New York City because soot would come in. And they've done great things, catalytic converters on cars, sewage treatment plants. I dove into the Hudson River. You know, now I would say stick a fork in it. It's done. Uh, they've got the air so much and water so pristine. They're going for minuscule improvements that would just kill on opportunity. But that's what bureaucrats do. If you're an EPA bureaucrat and you're not passing a new rule, you feel like you're not doing your job. And already the kind of people who volunteer to become EPA bureaucrats are often environmental zealots who don't like industry at all. So it's done its job, it should be shrunk, but I do think we need a government EPA. One more, who has the mic? Uh, Doc Kirby, the Hall School of Journalism and Communication. In the 19th century, the, prior to the Civil War, the biggest part of the government was the post office. Nowadays, do we need the post office anymore? No. I mean, maybe it ought to be out there competing, but it shouldn't have the government monopoly it has. I mean, the post office is a good example because the post office could not get it there overnight. It was just not possible. And they would bring in the brilliant managers from the private sector, and they just couldn't do it. And then FedEx happened, and United Parcel Service, and they could get it there overnight. And now even the post office does it sometimes. <laughs> it shows you what competition can do. And just before I end, though, because Scott said this is a, you know, you, these people will agree with you. I was like, well, what won't we agree on that we're going to have a discussion about? Since I'm in a conservative neighborhood, let me say, when government says they can protect us from people hurting themselves because they take cocaine or heroin, once again, I have to say, no, they can't. And here's my argument. Yes, these substances hurt some people. Uh, we libertarians say adults should own their own bodies and uh, they should have a right to hurt themselves. But independent of that, what is the effect of the law? It's supposed to prevent people from taking these things, does it? Doesn't seem to. I mean, maybe some people are deterred, but let me ask you students, when you were in high school, what was easier to get, uh, alcohol or weed? weed? Was it alcohol? How many, <laughs> how many say alcohol was, was easier to get? How many say weed was easier to get? 
All right, so the law doesn't even work. Also, it makes it cool to take these illicit substances. In Holland, where it's legal, 20% uh, of teenagers smoke. In the United States, it's 38%. In Portugal, where they've decriminalized all drugs, drug use stayed about the same. And drug abuse and drug crime and problems with drugs went down. I mean, I'm sure if everything were legal, there would be some people who would experiment and hurt themselves, but they would wise up. And the myths about these drugs, people say crack is this drug that can hook you for at one time and you can never get off. But then look at the government's own statistics. Millions of people have taken it, and how many people used it the last month? Not many. So most, and they didn't all die from using it, most stop on their own because there aren't enough treatment programs. At some point, people decide to give things up. And the main reason I say, no, they can't, and that government makes things worse, is that the government causes the drug crime. There are no wine gangs or beer cartels. <laughs> Nobody's knocking over 7-Elevens to get Marlboros. And the government says nicotine is just as addictive as heroin. I mean, we are killing thousands of people because of our laws and imprisoning more people as a percentage than any other country in the world. This is not a good thing. The drug war is an affront to a free people. Sorry to end on something many of you disagree with, but thank you for hearing me out. I'm going to go sign books over there. And here's the Declaration of Independence. Uh, <laughs>